So far, we've examined quite a few storage engines supported by MySQL, including Archive, which compresses by default values that are to be stored within the table, as well as Memory, which stores values in memory, preserves the structure in the event that MySQL fails, and when you bring MySQL back up, recreates a structure without the data. We've also looked at MyISAM, which is the default storage engine, as well as CSV, which outputs to comma-separated values which are commonly used within analytical tools such as spreadsheets. Now we want to focus on what's considered to be the heavy lifting or high-end storage engine for MySQL, and that's the InnoDB. Let's open a shell and open our notes and begin discussion about this particular storage engine. InnoDB provides support for large data sets and for high performance with large data sets. So when you are going to deploy MySQL in a critical transaction oriented environment, you don't even want to at this stage focus on MyISAM based tables. Although MyISAM tables have proven to be quite reliable based on the buzz that you'll find online surrounding MySQL over the years. But if transactions are necessary within your applications, then you'll want to focus on InnoDB because MyISAM currently, as of version 5.018, does not support transactions on a table basis. So let's label this section InnoDB Storage Engine and begin our discussion of this particular engine. Again, there are reasons why you want to use any of the storage engines. As you know, the default is MyISAM, but when planning your DBMS design, think about whether or not the DBMS should be a high, highly available and if it is a critical DBMS, and if so, then consider using InnoDB. So note, InnoDB storage engine is typically deployed in critical environments and also the secondary note would be that these environments tend to include support for transactions so note number two InnoDB supports transactions my ISAM does not. Very important to understand because again many applications support the notion of transactions which includes using the commit statement as well as a rollback statement as well as starting a transaction. So for example you may have a series of statements that are contingent upon one another and if any one of the statements fail you'd like to in most cases roll back the transaction. Well my ISM has no notion of transactional processing so as a result you'll want to use InnoDB. So InnoDB storage engine transaction oriented which means it supports again commit start transaction rollback etc. So this is an enterprise class storage engine with deployments out there ranging in the terabytes. Let's see if we have support for the InnoDB storage engine by connecting to our MySQL instance. You'll want to connect to any of your instances to verify likewise, but the default RPM binaries provide support for MySQL InnoDB. Let's launch MySQL. We'll connect as root and you'll see momentarily that after executing a show engines that we do have support for InnoDB but the default storage engine is my ISAM so just keep that in mind this particular storage engine supports transactions we'll reiterate it as often as necessary because often folks set up MySQL or MySQL on servers and provide access to their user community and when the server fails for a reason outside of the control of the software, for example, because of a hardware failure such as loss of power or a damaged disk, then you're likely to lose data when using other types of storage engines such as MySAM. But by then it may have been too late for you to recover critical data. So going in from a design perspective you want to consider using the right storage engine for the right application. Again CSV may suffice if you simply need to provide the data in a format that's 
analyzed by or that it's ready for an analytical tool such as Excel so that your analysts can make use of it. But again, InnoDB is where it's at when it comes to high performance. There are some other notes or features you should know about InnoDB with respect to the way it stores data. So another note is as follows. InnoDB with respect to storing data stores all table data or data in one file by default and that file is called ibdata1. So by default InnoDB will similar to other enterprise class SQL engines such as Microsoft's SQL will default to storing the table data information in one file as opposed to the way MyISAM stores data and that's in a one-to-one -one mapping one-to-one -one table to file mapping. Let's take a quick look at the shell we'll SUN and we'll just refresh our memories here by navigating into the default MySQL data directory which is located in varlib MySQL and as you know each database has its own directory beneath the default varlib MySQL or data directory so for any of the databases that we've worked with including HR let's navigate into HR for a moment you'll see that there are many files and as you know my ISAM based table data files are represented by the name of a table followed by MYD. But notice that for each table defined within the HR database, there is a corresponding table data file as well as an index file, as well as a form file or FRM file, which describes the structure of the table. With InnoDB being your storage engine, and you can mix and match by the way, all of the tables that are defined such as pay scale, employees, customers, 10 mil which we use for testing the archive storage engine will be represented simply by one file. Now by default InnoDB support is enabled on the server. We know that it's enabled because it's the default with MySQL binaries but not only that if you simply navigate into the default data directory varlib MySQL and do an lsltr you'll see that there's a file which represents the InnoDB default 10 megabyte data file. So this IB data file that you see here, IB data 1 that is, is the default InnoDB table data file. So InnoDB stores all data or all table data in one file by default and that's called IB data 1. And we should say that this is by default because by default even if you do not specify to provide support for InnoDB within your etc my.cnf file mysql by virtue of the way it was compiled for the binaries will create the support necessary for InnoDB including some implicit directives that direct the way InnoDB works as well as creation of those files so again InnoDB stores all table data file in one IB data one file that's a default and we should probably label this section as InnoDB storage defaults just so that you know and so that we can separate it. Additionally, InnoDB creates, we should say, and it will store, creates by default two log files and these two log files are of sizes 5 megabytes or are both 5 megabyte files. So two 5 megabyte log files. And let's take a brief look at the file system. In fact, we'll give you those names. They're IB underscore log file 0 and IB underscore log file 1. This is where you'll find transactional information. In a transaction oriented engine such as InnoDB, you'll find that there are transaction files, files which function as a buffer or a an area, a temporary area prior to committing the data that's been committed to the database into the actual table data file. So in other words, before a transactional database engine such as MySQL using InnoDB will commit whatever updates you've made or inserts to the direct table or even delete, it'll first commit those changes to the log files which function as buffers and then commit the changes to the primary file. So you effectively end up with a double write situation, but it's really for safety. The more times you write it, the more chances you are likely to expose errors and the more of a possibility that you have to facilitate 
a transactional environment such as a rollback. So for example, let's say you write or the system writes to a log file but then you issue a rollback or some failed situation or scenario such as a failed power or failed storage causes the system to not commit the entire transaction to the primary table file ibdata1 in ODB by default in conjunction with MySQL will roll back the changes from wherever those changes were stored in the log files so it's a buffer it's an intermediary stage before committing the data directly to the data files whereas with MyISAM based tables or non-transactional tables the data is committed directly after of course passing through memory as do all pieces of information but the data is committed directly to the MyISAM table files which are again located beneath each database directory and as you'll see with MySQL there are many MyISAM files but just so that you understand what it means when it's non-transactional with MyISAM tables you commit a change after it goes through memory it goes directly into the file let's say into the user.myd file whereas with a transactional and we'll just get IB star transactional based storage engine you commit changes which are stored in memory such as an insert or an update the changes enter the log file which serves as an intermediary stage and once it's committed to the log file then it's given an opportunity to be committed to the main database. Now if a crash occurs between you actually committing it to the primary log file, let's say IB underscore log file zero, and MySQL's attempt to commit it to the IB data one file, then MySQL can handle the transaction gracefully, either by rolling it back or committing it if all statements were actually cleared or all data is preserved again based on transactions so those two default log files are five megabytes each they're basically half the size of the default IB data one or table data file so you end up with two log files these are your transactional log files but by no means are we limited to these two log files or are limited to this lone 10 megabyte IB data one file other DBMS is just as a note such as Microsoft's SQL default to 10 megabyte files as well but this is the InnoDB default and it can be influenced and we'll show you certainly how that gets done so what else should you know some pointers before we jump into configuration about the InnoDB storage engine we did mention that you can mix and match so you can actually mix and match within one database different tables of different types so we should say and not beneath the storage default section, just beneath the basic InnoDB storage engine section that you may mix storage engine types in the same DB. So for example, if we have, as we do, an HR database, we're free to create tables within the HR database which are non-ISAM or non-MyISAM based tables. So for example, all of the tables, if we navigate into HR, are my ISAM base, with the exception of the archive storage engine. For the most part, the tables are my ISAM base. We could go ahead and create a new table, which we'll be doing shortly, that is based entirely on InnoDB and execute same, the same DML as well as DDL statements against any of the tables within the database, and they'll perform as expected. So, in other words, you can mix and match tables of different storage types which is pretty impressive using MySQL so you can you may have for example within a database such as HR a primary table such as employees and your employees table may be considered transactional or very critical or important and it may be a table that you may not want to store using the MyISAM storage engine whereas the other tables you may not have that sort of problem but you can mix and match so you could make employees for example in ODB and the other tables, MyISAM or some other storage engine, CSV or whatever suits your application. Super. Now there's still other notes to know about InnoDB. Another thing that you need to know is that we're not restricted as mentioned to one table data file. We can define, and we'll ultimately show you how, multiple table data files and distribute the data across them. So we can instruct the InnoDB engine to make use of multiple files. It defaults, of course, to writing to the first file first, and then when it exhausts the storage, using the second file. But internally, MySQL, in conjunction with the InnoDB storage engine, will keep track of where your table data is located. So some of a table's data may be located in one file, such as IB data one and 
the remainder of that data may be in a separate file such as IB data 2 super so those are some of the things that you need to know about how this particular engine works and what the benefits are potentially for your environment Now, next what we're gonna do is alter the configuration so that the file names are created the way we want them to be created and want to talk about some of the key configuration options and it will set up a table structure based on InnoDB and begin our studies of InnoDB. So now that we've spent a little time discussing InnoDB, let's go ahead and show you where configuration changes are to be committed in order to effect the changes that are necessary. So in other words, in order to provide support for InnoDB. So first in support, we want to modify etc my.cnf. So we're going to be working with etc my.cnf to define the directives that are important to provide the proper support. Now what we mean by the proper support is as follows. MySQL is up and running and InnoDB is certainly supported and there is a default file as we've shown you. Let's LSLTR again. IB star. There is a default table data file that we could use which defaults to 10 megabyte, megabytes and would actually automatically extend if we were to insert additional data. Maybe we should start by examining this additional this this file, this first file, loading data into it that's larger than 10 megabytes, and then showing you how to alter the configuration. So by using the defaults, and we know that these are the defaults because if we take a brief look at etc my.cnf, you'll see it really doesn't contain any information about InnoDB. It has prompt related information so that when we log in we get a nice prompt. It has client options which are commented out and it has server options related to logging but not to InnoDB. So what you see here represents the defaults, the internals or the internal defaults set within MySQL. We can exceed these defaults quite easily by just generating a 10 million text file which we've done and importing it into an InnoDB based table. Let's navigate into the HR directory. Let's see if we still have that file 10 underscore mil dot text and we don't so we'll generate it again by using sequence let's generate 10 underscore mil dot text by sending 10 million values into it and this will be created momentarily now while this goes into or while this is output into the file let's go ahead in a separate window and drop the 10 mil table we'll use HR and the reason why I want to drop it because it's currently defined as a storage engine that we don't want to work with. It's non InnoDB, in other words. And notice that the, t the change into the HR table took, database, that is, took a little while because we're pressuring the system, apparently. Let's execute a show create table against 10 underscore mil, and you'll see that this particular table is based on the archive storage engine. We could execute an alter statement, which would cause it to go from one table type to another or we could simply drop it and recreate it. Since we're not interested in the data and we want to reinsert it, let's simply just drop the table. So we'll drop table 10 underscore mil followed by a create table if not exists, which it doesn't, but it's good to put the syntax. 10 underscore mil followed by a type such as the following. ID and that's the only column that we need because it'll be inserted for us by the import process, the MySQL import. We'll make it big int and this should suffice. Let's go ahead and execute this command and we'll show tables once more and then a show create table for 10 mil once more and you'll see that it's now my ISAM. Well, we meant to make this in ODB so let's go ahead and drop it again and set the engine this time to be Inno DB. And we meant to specify the engine statement outside of the last parentheses. Let's just fix the syntax. It should be after we've defined the individual columns. And now we've created this new 10 underscore mil table. Let's, but the initial drop statement ran with, successfully prior to the failure of the incorrect syntax which explains why we have this error 1051 unknown table because it was already dropped. 
Let's show create table again, which should be in our history, and you'll see that it's now of type NODB. But it contains no data, so the 10 megabyte file which exists on the file system is fine. Well, LSLTRH, one level up, IB star, and this 10 meg file has not been exhausted yet. However, the 10 underscore mil dot text file certainly has more data than 10 megabytes. It, in fact, uncompressed contains 109 megabytes. We should change the name of the file. If you notice, we're missing an L. So let's change it so that it matches the name of the table exactly, because that is the requirement of the MySQL import utility, at least of the, as of the current version. So let's move 10 underscore mil dot txt to 10 underscore mil with an extra L dot txt properly spelled. Now that this is all in place, we want to execute a familiar MySQL import command to have this particular data imported into the InnoDB file which rests on a 10 megabyte file on the file system and that's that ibdata1 file just to show you what happens when the default file is in use so we'll go ahead and execute a MySQL import a column is not necessary because the default column will be used we want to log in as our default user we'll have it prompt us for a password we want to use the HR database and we want to import using the 10 underscore mil dot text file. Let's go ahead and then it'll prompt us. Now the file is being imported, the 10 underscore mil dot text file, which is 109 megs uncompressed in its native ASCII state. And this particular file will import itself, and you'll see. Let's just quit this existing instance, SUN, and then navigate to var lib mysql to see what's happening with the IB data file. There's the IB data file, and let's turn on the H option. Notice that IB data 1 has grown considerably. In fact, an order of magnitude, almost, and now it's exceeded an order of magnitude to reflect the data that's currently being inserted. So we're inserting a 109 megabyte file into what was initially defined as a 10 megabyte IB data 1 file. But guess what? This tells us, and rather than just stating it, we saw it, this tells us that the default IB data 1 file is defined to be automatically extended by MySQL. So let's take down some notes. We'll say note in ODB automatically or maybe automagically automagically extends the default 10 megabyte file to accommodate additional data that's important so you know you're not restricted but ideally within an enterprise DBMS environment you want to plan as much as possible and in your planning process you should attempt to forecast your data storage needs wherever possible because what this will do for us is avoid unnecessary usage of the hard drive since the slowest component in a computer system is any mechanical component we should try to avoid the hits to the hard drive as much as possible by forecasting properly and the way we would have forecasted properly in this case would have been to simply create an IB data one file that could accommodate the full data set rather than having MySQL dynamically extended on the fly because the more hits to the file system the slower the performance and as a result the less likely your server is going to be able to keep up with the queries and the concurrent connections notice that InnoDB has already exceeded three orders of magnitude approaching five orders of magnitude all to represent 109 megabytes of ASCII text data so it's taking a while to import it and you'll see eventually it'll fit but it just takes a while so that's something you want to keep in mind the default 10 megabyte file will be grown but this tells us that in the etc my.cnf file when we define our InnoDB storage spaces on the file system we may specify based on our forecasting capabilities so note try to forecast data storage needs as much as possible to avoid let's say superfluous input output or IO 
This applies to any DBMS engine, not just MySQL. If you are familiar with Microsoft's SQL, for example, simply consider the way it allocates or auto extends. It's the same thing. You may define a DB with a default of, let's say, 100 megabytes, but as you continue to insert data or grow the database, the operating system is responsible for and does extend the file. But of course, that comes as a, at a hit, and that's at an, an I.O. hit. So it took us a little while to upload the 1 million records into the file. Let's take a look at its final size. Amazing, but it's taken 522 megabytes to represent what the file system represents using 109 megabytes. But the records have been inserted. Of course, we're going to go ahead and query it to see that it's there. So let's log in. We'll prompt for password, of course. And then we'll use HR followed by show tables. And you'll see that the 10 underscore mil table exists. Again, a show create statement table that is create statement table or create table statement that is will reveal that it still is in ODB. Just want to be sure that we're on the same page here. So it is in ODB with the default character set. Now let's go ahead and select count rather than dumping everything to the screen, which is another slow place to write from 10 underscore mil and it'll count the rows by performing a page scan or a full table scan and return it to us momentarily but you should expect the values that we've imported to be apparent now all this query runs and it's taking a while again the file in the file system is five times the size of the original file roughly let's lsltrh IB data one level up and the IB data file can be grown to accommodate additional tables what's important to understand about this particular storage engine is that all table data is represented by the default IB data one file and that is a default again we can extend it across many files but the default will place it into one file and because it's transactional you'll find that there are multiple that's LSLTRH here, IB star, there are multiple files. Two 5 megabyte files which function as transaction log buffers and one primary table data file. Here are all one, 10 million, that is, records, but it took 21 seconds to return that query. Now certainly we'd want to define indices on this particular file or on this particular table which is stored in the IB data one file to increase the speed in which the DBMS returns the results and we can do that as well now the way indices work within an InnoDB structure is that the indices are not stored in a separate file if you recall from the shell let's navigate in the HR well LSLTR and if you recall for each my ISAM table the table has a form file it also has an MYD table data file and an MYI file. So in other words, the index file is separate from the table data file. With InnoDB, both indices as well as table data information are stored within the same IB data one file or n number of data files that you've specified by way of the etc my.cnf file, configuration file. So in other words, the data info or the main data and the index information are both lumped into one file. So keep that in mind. Now, in the interest of saving time, we've gone ahead and created an index on the table just to show you that the file size has grown. Let's clear screen and take a brief look at that again. And notice the IB data one file contains almost a gigabyte worth of information with the index now defined on the 10 mil table or 10 underscore mil table. So we've created the index and a separate file was not created and also witness that the log files, the transaction log files, have not changed in size. They remain at 5 megabytes, but the IB data one file has grown or almost doubled to 914 megabytes by virtue of creating an index. From the MySQL terminal monitor, let's execute a show index from 10 underscore mil, and you'll see that there is an index defined. We missed an L here you'll see that there is an index defined on the primary column within the particular table. So now we can query things much faster. So for example, we could execute a select star from 10 underscore mil where let's say ID is equivalent to 
800 or let's go at 85,000 and it will return very quickly just by virtue of turning on the index but that shouldn't come as a surprise so the bottom line is what we wanted to illustrate is that when using InnoDB table data as well as index data gets stored in the same file now you may be wondering what happens if you were to truncate the table as you can do with my ISAM type tables well if we go ahead and execute a select count star against the table let's see how many records we come up with and we'll show tables and it's returning zero but it really contains more if we were to we missed the from that's why as usual if we were to truncate this particular table now this select count will take a little bit to run maybe about 15 to 20 seconds if we were to truncate it you may be wondering what exactly happens to this IB data one file will it actually return to its original size of 10 megabytes it won't once you've allocated space, the space on your system to InnoDB InnoDB owns it unless you go through other routines which we'll show you to reclaim that size but once the database has it it has it so we've gone from 10 megs to almost 100 times 10 megs and we're going to truncate the table momentarily so here you see we have a 10 million rows let's go ahead and execute a truncate table against 10 underscore mil to wipe all of the records to zero it out and of course truncating is always quicker always easier now from the file system let's take a brief look notice my SQL still owns that 914 megs or we should more properly say that InnoDB owns that 914 megs although we've wiped or truncated a table we can go ahead and simply drop the table 10 underscore mil and return to the shell and you'll see momentarily that the 914 megabytes still exists how about if we were to execute an RC MySQL which is the start stop script for MySQL within a SUSE environment let's execute a restart for example which is equivalent to a stop and a start this will stop it then it'll start it then we'll relist the var my or var live MySQL directory to see the current size of the IB data one direct uh, file within the directory and notice the log files are still 5 megs but the data file is still 914 megs so similar to other enterprise class DBs such as Microsoft's Exchange, SQL, Oracle etc allocation occurs on the fly auto extension occurs on the fly but deallocation doesn't and requires administrative interjection to reclaim the space utilized Super. So you know a little bit about the way InnoDB handles files, the way it auto extends the default database from 10 to whatever you need to support your data. Next, we're going to look at the etc my.cnf file, ways of configuring it to start up InnoDB with the way we want the system to be configured for optimal performance. Let's proceed with our studies of InnoDB, the high performance, highly scalable database engine for MySQL. So we've done a little work. You know that the file's 914 megabytes. That's what we've currently allocated. But what if we wanted to alter our environment to influence the way InnoDB is, gets configured when the system starts? In order to affect InnoDB at startup time, modify etc my.cnf which is read by mysql by default so we'll label this section influence or influencing in ODB's default db settings at startup so we'll modify etc my.cnf there's no need to memorize the directives with the exception of maybe some of the basic directives but you don't need to outright memorize them because sample configuration files ship with MySQL for all distributions. On SUSE you can search for sample configs in user share doc packages in MySQL server standard. Again you don't even need to memorize this because for example from the shell if you simply execute an RPM query all 
to dump all packages and then grep using a case insensitive search for MySQL. You'll see that there are a few MySQL or packages and the MySQL server package contains everything pertaining to the server. If we were to dump the contents of this particular package by executing an RPM query list followed by the prefixed name in the package and then sending that output to the pager, you'll see that the documentation is in user share doc packages. And in user, user share doc packages MySQL server standard you'll find configs for small, medium, large and heavy duty and huge configurations. Let's go ahead and take a brief look by navigating into user share doc packages MySQL server standard. Each of these files contains variations that helps you to tune your environment and these have been prepared by the folks at MySQL AB for optimal performance. If we take a brief look at the my-small.cnf you'll see that it contains some basic directives including the port that the client should use, 3306, and the default socket. There's a section for MySQLD which also includes a port that it should listen to. Also the socket, varlib MySQL, mysql.soc. You'll notice that both clients and servers connect to the same socket because the client's able to communicate with MySQL server without using TCP. So in the event that you skip networking, then MySQL will simply bind to the socket and you can initiate connections locally on the host, avoiding any TCP base flaws or exploits. And there's some other directives such as the key buffer for a small server is set to 16K. The, the maximum allowed packet is set to 1 megabyte. The values in this file are represented by K, M, and G for k kilobyte, megabyte, and gigabyte, respectively. And there's some other key directives. There's a server ID defined if in the event that you have replication set up. And all the InnoDB settings are disabled. But by default, with the small configuration, there will be a 10 megabyte file created. And notice there's a whole block here for InnoDB which we'll copy to work with. But we'll take it from one of the other files momentarily. Let's take a brief look at the medium file just to see what the differences are. And you'll just see that in terms of memory utilization, the values are higher. For example, the maximum allowed packet is the same, but the key buffer is 16 megabytes. Let's keep scrolling through and you'll see there's replication related information. The server ID on this is set to 2 if it's uncommented. Temp directories are defined. The key buffer is 20 megabytes for ISM check, which checks my ISM style tables. The maximum allowed packet size for MySQL dump is 16 megabytes and so forth. How about looking at the large configuration or the even the InnoDB heavy 4 gigabyte configuration? When you navigate to the InnoDB related settings, and you'll see that momentarily, there's a block specifically for InnoDB based tables. You'll see that these options are optimal. Here they are. They're actually revealed. So for example, additional memory pool is set to 16 megabytes. This is higher than normal. And each of the key directives are prefixed with a description so that you're not left in the dark. The data file path specifies a default 10 megabyte file, but there are other directives such as the thread concurrency which are higher, the log buffer size, and so forth. So in the large configuration you'll find greater values. The log size is 256 megs instead of a default of 5, for example and ISM check has 512 megabytes. The values are simply greater in the larger configurations because the assumption is that you have more hardware resources to spare. So let's copy the block from my small.cnf. We could take it from any one of them. It's just that in a small file they're all lumped into one section because they're currently disabled. Notice it also says on, on comment in the event that you want to use these particular directives. We'll copy this block discuss each of the options and then paste them into our my.cnf. Again, unless you specify these key InnoDB related directives such as where the data home directory is and so forth, MySQL assumes defaults. The defaults that are assumed are what you see here. For example, the data home directory is varlib MySQL, but you could respecify it or specify a blank value 
and then specify individual storage locations for individual files which we'll show you in a separate section. Here's the default size of the file, 10 megabytes set to extend or auto extend, the group home directory, the log archive, the buffer pool set to 16 megabytes but notice it says this particular value should be set to 50 to 80 percent worth of RAM. Our system has 512 megs of memory so this particular directive should be at least 256 for our system especially if the system is primarily a DBMS server. Generally you'll want to dedicate a box to DBMS activities. And notice 25 percent is the suggestion for the buffer pool size or 25 percent of the buffer pool size. So if you set a buffer pool size of 256, then your log file sizes should be roughly a quarter of each of these. Those are the suggested values that have been tested by the folks over at MySQLAB. So for example, we could estimate for the log file sizes that you see here, 64 megabytes to be roughly 25 percent. Super. So let's copy these directives over. Now we need to uncomment the key values. We're going to copy the entire block, but we want an InnoDB data file path. That's important to us. We also want to increase the InnoDB buffer pool size because our system has more RAM. We also want to increase the size of the, the log files from a default of 5 megs up. And the buffer size will let this or increase this to 16 megabytes. Again, these are to be tuned on a per system basis. There isn't a magic formula, but there are some rough guesstimations such as percentages of current resources on the system. Now what if we want our IB data one file to have a default of rather than 10 megabytes, let's say a gigabyte as the default. Instead of specifying it in M, we'll just say simply 1G. This is sufficient to specify a default file of 1 gigabyte. So let's go ahead and copy this entire InnoDB block and paste it into our my.cnf file. And again, for more information on the specifics of each of the variables, just consult the reference manual. But the major ones includes the ones that we've already modified, including the buffer pool size, which is critical, the InnoDB log file size, as well as the default data file size for IB Data 1. Let's nano etc, well nano is not installed, so we'll pico etc my.cnf and beneath the server section or mysqld section we'll paste the values that are copied into memory that relate to InnoDB. But of course we'll need to restart mysql, so let's save the changes here and we'll clear screen, we'll change into our default data directory mysql and execute an RC MySQL stop followed by a start to cleanly shut then restart. Although generally speaking a restart will perform a similar task. Alright so MySQL is restarted and you'll see momentarily that the file is still the original or extended 914 megabytes. That's LSLTR IB star and here's the file if we add the H option you'll see it's still 914 megabytes but is growable. Now we don't have any tables stored to IB Data 1 so we could stop the server and remove it altogether. Let's stop it and we'll get rid of the IB files. Let's remove RF IB star and then restart the server and you'll see what happens. MySQL is restarting, it's parsing its directives We'll give it a little while to come up, and it should be up momentarily. And once the file is created, typically the files that are used are zeroed out, or in other words, the application places zero values, writes zeros to them, and to be sure that the file is writable altogether. This is why it's taking so long to come up this time. Let's LSLTRH this time, and notice that the new IB Data 1 file has been created, and guess what? The log file is also created, or both log files are created, of, a, of sizes 60, or of the size 64 megabytes each. Let's LSLTRH, IB star, and here are our new InnoDB files. Two 64 megabyte transactional log files, 
as well as one one gigabyte IB data one file. There is no data in the IB data one file, but we are now free to insert data and to grow beyond the one gigabyte. Now the default is to grow until almost the entire file system's out of space. So you want to be aware. In the next section what we're going to do is show you how to control the Macs and so forth. But the default once again is to just grow until you're pretty much out of space. If you want to know what space is available, execute a df-h against the current partition that you're logged into. We're logged into or connected to forward slash var and a df-h against var shows that var is truly a separate partition which has 19 gigabytes available. However, there are other partitions on the system. We set up the system purposely with multiple partitions because we knew we were going to be doing this database edition and would want to spread the InnoDB files eventually across multiple partitions to illustrate the potential of optimizing performance. Again, performance is realized when you spread the table data files across as many different spindles or physical hard drives as possible. And as you can see here, we have SDA, SDC, and SDB. These are three separate hard drives that we could spread InnoDB related data across. And if you want your table data to be spread sooner than later, create smaller individual files and spread those smaller files so that MySQL occupies the first initially then second and so forth and begins begins using those spindles as soon as possible but again the file exists and we can feel free to use it and the file will not grow beyond the size unless it really needs it so if we created a table and inserted a record the file will not grow beyond one gigabyte let's return to the shell here and let's execute a show tables we've already dropped 10 underscore mil let's create a new table and we'll call this one test underscore InnoDB1 and we should use if not exists just to be consistent and let's give it an auto incremented using int column setting the primary key as usual to ID followed by let's say simply name and we'll make it var car 255 this should suffice but of course we want the engine to be in ODB and its case insensitive so specify it however you want we now have a new table let's show tables you'll see that new test underscore in ODB1 we'll describe it and as you can see it has two columns now let's show create table test underscore in ODB1 and you'll see that it's of type in ODB but it contains no data before inserting any data from a file system perspective let's lsltr h ib star and notice the file still one gigabyte let's look at it without the h option the human readable option and you'll see that it's 107 whatever this value is We'll then go ahead and insert data into it. It's only one column, so let's insert into test underscore InnoDB1, and we'll set name equivalent to Linux CBT, and then terminate query. We'll then select star. So let's go ahead, and there are other commands such as show table status, which would show you how many records and so forth. But this is simply select star from test underscore ido db1, and it contains one value. Now let's relist from a file system perspective, and you'll notice the IB data one file has not extended, and it shouldn't. The reason why MySQL took a long time to start. The last time we started is because we wiped the IB data one file, and we instructed. MySQL to create a one gigabyte default IB data one file. So it had to write zeros or create that empty file. And it does so to test that the file is writable and is consistent and doesn't break and reserves the, the written values as placeholders that it may use for overwriting for the storage of new data. So we have this new file. Neither and as well as the two new log files, but neither one of them have grown any because the defaults are more than enough. 
Now, if we were to insert enough data to exceed the one gigabyte, of course, you'll expect the InnoDB engine to simply grow the file to the new size. Super. So this is quite easy to understand so far, but you won't really see the effects of InnoDB until you attempt to use it in a critical, high storage, high availability, transaction-oriented environment. That's when you'll really see the difference between the storage engines. As you can tell from this particular example, there isn't much you can tell. So really, it comes down to it later on when you want to scale your database structure much larger. So next, we look at creating multiple data files using InnoDB. So, so far we've reissued our MySQL server to create a new InnoDB file to go to work for us. It's now one gigabyte, and we could change that if we'd like very easily. Let's just go through the routine one more time. This time we'll make the file instead of one gigabyte, let's make it two gigabytes or even three gigabytes because on some systems some older Linux systems two gigabytes is the most you can make or create a file it's a limit and by the way MySQL's InnoDB engine will allow you to spread your data across multiple two gigabyte files so one table can span multiple two gigabyte files if you indeed work on such a system but they're not as common nowadays so if you're constructing a new system using MySQL you should try to use at least the latest release of Linux or perhaps FreeBSD or Solaris so in MySQL let's go ahead and drop the table we don't need it we no longer need it and by the way if you were to remove the file from the file system your table data gets lost but that should go without saying we'll drop table test underscore InnoDB1 now it's gone, and we'll RC MySQL stop, at which point we'll remove all three files, the log as well as the two log files in the data file. Let's remove our FIB star, that's gone, and the my.cnf file needs to be updated to reflect our new changes. So we'll pico etc my.cnf, and we'll just change the areas that are important. We want the new size to be, let's say, 3 gigabytes. And if you can spare more memory, if you can give it the server, the MySQL server, more memory, do so. So let's go with 384, for example. But be careful not to cause your operating system to inadvertently page. And again, the log file size should be roughly 25% of the buffer pool size. So let's go ahead and set this to about 96 megabytes. That should get us close. And the buffer log size will set this to 32 megabytes. Once saved, we'll restart MySQL. And as you know, this will create the new IB files. So let's execute an RC MySQL start. And if you want, you can time how long it takes on a pretty fast system by executing time followed by the command. This will time the entire command sequence and return how long it takes. So this is still starting, it'll take a little bit to come up and the time will res return the value for us that we can make use of at a separate time. So when that gets created we're going to recreate the table structure. So let's find that create table statement from our memory and there it is in db and we define the ID column as int. Let's go with big int so it can store more values in the event that we want to import a large set of data. And the server's crawling at this stage. In a separate window, if we execute uptime, you'll see that the utilization is pretty high. Or if we execute top, it'll also show that the utilization is high. Let's run it and see what returns towards the top of the process listing. We should see MySQL, the start process, taking forever. And as you can see, it's taking that long just to return top to us and as you can see MySQL threw an error now when MySQL throws an error regarding startup especially after you've made changes to InnoDB you can consult the error log that's LSLTR there's an error log file in here that we should look at and that's the server name dot ERR and we'll show you exactly what happened we ran out of space look at the file ibdata1 well LSLTRH IB star this file made it pretty much to 3 gigabytes, but now let's execute a DFH 
and if we haven't then it threw an error because it timed out we actually have 17 gigs so in this case we didn't run out of space had we used a different partition we would have but in this case we didn't so I thought we actually wrote the file to the SDA3 or data3 partition so that isn't the case so the file was actually successfully created so let's check the status of MySQL we'll net stat NTL to see if 3306 is listening and it is so the fail that was returned was a false alarm. It seems as if it failed, but it really didn't. It took 51 seconds to create that 3 gigabyte file, and now we have InnoDB capabilities. So from the client, let's go ahead and create this new data structure. And there it is. Of course, the client first complains about having lost its connection to the server, subsequently creating the table. And we will subsequently execute a show table to confirm that it's done so followed by a show create table test underscore InnoDB1 just to be sure that it's using the InnoDB engine and it is because the engine is specified as such but there's no data to exhaust the three gigabytes so our system doesn't have the two gigabyte limit and the file has been created LSLTRH IB star we have two 96 megabyte files to handle transactions as well as a three gigabyte data file and this file exists on the file system but what about doing other things other neat things such as creating multiple files to store table data or even setting additional parameters such as extensions how much you'll allow MySQL to extend a data file and so forth or even altering the increment value well let's continue our discussion here by mentioning the syntax that's used for specifying the data file so data file and that's in you know, db data file syntax is as follows you'll first specify in odb the key variable in odb underscore data underscore file underscore path equals and that's what you see up here followed by the syntax which resembles the following now we want to specify the file name and the file name as you know defaults to IDB data one but it could be anything else so the syntax is really as follows file one so let's go at file one colon file one size which is specified using M or G of course an integer than M or G for megabyte or gigabyte respectively followed by file 2 colon file 2 underscore size M or G now there are some options that we can throw on here such as how much will allow the MySQL database management system to extend a given file that's been defined. We may start at 10 and say the file cannot grow beyond 50 megabytes, for example. Or we can set a ceiling on the files that we define. That's entirely up to you. There is a directive called max which allows you to do that. But just a quick note. Let's, let's copy this syntax and show you how the alternate syntax would look. And we'll label this InnoDB data file syntax options for max size and auto extension so if your intent is to not let MySQL handle growing your database file or database files to the max that it can be well it's really only one file for this version that it can handle then you're free to specify after you've specified the file and its size a max value so for example we may specify a file like the following ID or IB data one followed by let's say 500 M for 500 megabytes followed by max the keyword max followed by a max file size such as 1 GB this would be perfectly legit and what MySQL would do is size the file so that it cannot exceed one gigabyte it'll start out being 500 megabytes 
and grow to potentially one gigabyte. Let's go ahead and specify this syntax in our my.cnf file to see how it would look. Now we're not going to pump data in to, to force MySQL to grow it, but you'll get the picture that it'll size the file to be 500 megabytes, which is really all we need to illustrate. Pico etc my.cnf and just simply find the InnoDB data file path, comment it out, and just type in a, a new directive, which in this case will be InnoDB data file path equals and the new string. And we press Control V instead of Control Shift V, and there's the value. So in fact, it already had the variable name. So it's InnoDB. We'll set it to a min of 500 and a max of 1 gig. And we'll just comment the section to say min equals 500 MB megabytes, max equals 1 GB or 1 gigabyte. But the syntax accepts only G or M, not GB or MB. So this would create a 500 megabyte file. Let's save it. We'll RC MySQL stop. This will kill the currently running shell that we have open, or session that's open over here. And once this finishes, let's LSLTR IB star and just get rid of IB star. The IB star files are gone. And now let's restart MySQL. Should be somewhere in our history. It'll read the new directive and create a 500 megabyte file. It's LSLTRH, IB star. And let's try that again. Let's LSLTR. And in this case, there must have been an error causing MySQL to not create the InnoDB files. Let's confirm our syntax. And again, the error file will also tell us the story. We can tail Linux cbtdb oneerr and look for any indication of what could have gone wrong. And it shows that the shutdown was complete. Let's tail a few more lines. We'll tail the last 50 lines and then pipe the output to less see exactly why MySQL complained. Any InnoDB related information will throw errors. Notice it had a problem finding the existing log files and that's because it knows that there's a table that's contingent upon the existence of the two transactional files as well as the original one gigabyte file that we define. So it knows that it can't find it and as a result it doesn't bring it up. And if we scan through this log file, we should come up with something that indicates that the syntax is incorrect related to the creation of the 500 megabyte file. Let's keep going through this log file. We should see something regarding syntax error in the InnoDB specification. Here it is, InnoDB syntax error, which means that there's a syntax error. We probably forgot the auto extend option. Let's pico etc my.cnf and that's what's missing. Notice we put 500 megs as the min and then we followed up with max but we need to instruct MySQL to extend the file if necessary or extend to a greater size if necessary. Let's go ahead and RC MySQL stop followed by start and try this again and now it's restarting it's going to go through the ropes again. Let's see what happens. So this is a little bit about working with these DBs. But again, when you work with these files, you get increased performance. And there's even a better way of increasing performance, and that's to use raw devices. Let's LSLTRH. And notice we now have a fresh 500 megabyte IB data one file. So the error that we made was we didn't include the auto extend, which is logical, of course. So auto extend should be right here which simply means the following. It's read from left to right as min permitted to auto extend max. Without the auto extend, MySQL fails to create the file. Now we have that 500 megabyte file from the MySQL terminal monitor. Let's show tables from the HR database and notice that the test underscore InnoDB1 exists. Let's go ahead and select star from test underscore InnoDB1 
and notice it says it doesn't exist because there's a new file so within the schema within the form file for the database it knows that there is a table called test underscore nodb1 the schema tells the mysql dbms that but the mere fact that we remove the IB data one file causes this current situation so what we should do is drop table test underscore nodb1 we can recreate it but it no longer exists so that is the the current situation let's specify that with an s and it still shows up and there are other ways of removing it of course but we can't access it we could however create a new table let's find a create table statement from our history and we'll call this one nodb1 let's show tables let's rerun the query that's the select star from and it doesn't run we created we should create this as nodb2 not as the original name because it's still a bad pointer let's go ahead and execute show tables again and we'll select star from nodb2 and this runs nicely so we have a broken table in test underscore nodb1 but that was expected because we purposely mucked around with the settings to show you that you could specify a min and grow it to a max no differently than you can in other dbms environments such as microsoft's sql so it's quite possible we can define it but there's some key directives here that you want to follow up on using the reference material and again we did mention that you can create multiple files that certainly is a possibility here's how you'd go about doing it so let's label this section create multiple table data in ODB files so as you know we have been studying MySQL on a high performance server and it's got dual processors with hyper threading so it's like four processors a cat proc CPU info reveals processors 0 through 3 which means four processors and a DF dash H for human readable reveals that there are three separate disks they may or may not be rated but there are three different disks SDA SDB and SDC all with partitions and all with available storage SDA as you can see only has for this particular partition 83 megs but SDA2 has 19 gigabytes SDA2 is where var is located if we dfh var you'll see that it's on oh it's actually on SDB3 so SDB3 if we look at our partition structure represents var that's the top one up here SDA2 which also has 19 gigs is a separate disk and we can create a file there and we also have SDB1 SDA3 so really what we want to do is take this whole partition layout and place it into our text file and then make the changes that are necessary to to affect multiple files across the file system so first you begin with a layout of your file system this is what we have available excluding the root partition which currently houses var we recognize that by executing a dfh var and it told us that var is mounted on sdb3 and so is root so excluding the root file system which has about 20 gigabytes free we have quite a bit to work with we can spread files all across the system including we'll exclude SDA1 that seems to be the boot partition because it's about 100 megs we have SDC1 SDA3 SDA2 as well as SDB1 let's place this in order in logical order so we'll put SDC towards the bottom and put two towards the top just so it's logically laid out so here's how we want to lay out our file system based on or lay out our you know DB data files within our file system based on the way we have our disks laid out in the system let's create a 5 gigabyte file or in this case since we only have a 3.8 here we can do a 5 on one let's say 3 on the other 6 on the other and perhaps 25 on the other sounds like a lot but it's really not a big deal so what we want to do is create one f 5 gig for one of the partitions SDA2 that is SDA2 has 19 gigabytes free so we'll make it 5 and we want for the next partition to use 3 gigabytes and the next to use 6 gigabytes and the final one to use 25 gigabytes that's quite possible just take the nodb string that we've been working with and 
just keep appending your data files. But you'll notice one issue that we hope remains a limitation for not too long, and you'll, as a result, have to consult the MySQL documentation, but it'll be to your benefit. And that is the fact that when you lay out multiple files, you can only auto-extend and send to a max of a certain size or auto-extend the final file. So we're going to define four files here to be stored across four partitions. But the fact of the matter is that only the last file can be specified as auto-extend. So the last file, which will be 25 gigabytes, will be housed in a partition that can store up to 28 gigabytes, at least as of now. So how would we write this? We can use the same names for consistency, IBData1, for example. We'll set IBData1 to be 5G, but it's not as simple as this. We need to specify where on the file system they're located, or these particular files are to be written. So we want to write them similar to what the DF output shows. For example, SDA2 is mounted on forward slash data2. So we'll go ahead and, met and specify forward slash data2 forward slash IB data one. So just indicate the absolute path each step of the way for each data file that's to be created and you should be okay. Let's get rid of this auto extended stuff and then move on to the next file. So the next file we'll specify will be located at data three and it'll be called IB data two with a size of three G for three gigabyte. The third file will be located at data four and it'll be called IBData3 with a file size of 6G. And the final file will be located at data5 and we'll call it IBData4 with a file size of 25G. This will create all the files that we want. And if we want the ability to extend the 25 gigabyte file on SDC1 up to the max, let's say 28 gigs, we certainly can, or we can limit it. So we could say something like the following, colon auto extend, but this only applies to the last file, and we hope again that this is a limitation that's lifted. Eventually what we'd like to see is the ability to specify auto extend and a max size per file, and I'm sure the folks at MySQLAB will include it. So auto extend max, let's say 27 GB leaving 27G that is leaving one gigabyte free for the operating system. A string such as what we have here will allow us to create multiple files. And there's another quick note that we should mention regarding auto extension. Note, auto extension occurs in eight megabyte blocks. So if you want to influence this, you certainly can, but the default is to increment when MySQL needs to allocate more space in 8 me megabyte increments. If you do want to influence it, simply set without using the set prefix and without the single quotes, nodb auto extend, and this will be set in the my.cnf file, underscore increment equals whatever value you want such as 16m or 1g or whatever you want 1g would be 1 gigabyte m would represent megabyte so simply setting this variable in etc my.cnf will influence the block sizes that mysql uses for auto extension so let's go ahead we want to define this data file so that we can stretch it across the file system and there is one other variable. There seem to be a never-ending list of requirements to enable some of these changes. But there is another variable that's required to affect this change, and let's explain why it's necessary. By default, MySQL defaults to looking in varlib MySQL for its data files. When using InnoDB or any type of table structure or table engine such as MySAM, it defaults to varlib MySQL. However, when you're, you want to spread data files across your file system in different locations using various absolute paths, there's one other variable that's required. We'll show you what that is momentarily. And that one other directive is actually called the InnoDB data home directory, which again defaults to varlib MySQL. So we need to set InnoDB underscore data underscore home underscore directory equal to nothing. We need to negate it or unset it if you will, make it a blank, undefine it. So let's confirm our syntax. We have InnoDB data home directory unset from 
varlib mysql causing mysql to read the absolute path from the way we've specified them for each data file and we separate each data file from another data file using semicolons so this is an error right here it's actually semicolon not colon so we specify the syntax the way we have but we use semicolon to separate the different data files that's the difference so that mysql can differentiate between an option for a data file and a separate data file altogether and the final data file can accept arguments such as auto extend and max so we have data 5 specified or the data 5 partition that is and they're all seemingly terminated by semicolons let's go ahead and specify these options in our etc my.cnf file and of course there's more it never ends there but we'll paste this in for now and discuss what we need to do to affect this momentarily so we'll control shift v and notice that the inodb data home directory was carried over when we copied it from the sample file because it certainly exists in the sample and whenever you see a variable that's commented with a value that typically indicates that it's the default value also when using an editor such as pico or nano try to backspace to keep things on the same line otherwise they're treated as separate lines notice a control c says that this is line 18 but if we move up it's line 17 so get everything on one line and finally before we go off dumping data files and restarting the server let's drop the test in ODB2 table because it's bound to the existing data file so let's drop table in ODB2 test in ODB2 and from the shell we want to confirm that for each mount point MySQL the user is able to write to the mount point so MySQL the user needs permissions to the mount point so let's include that in our notes note MySQL needs write permissions to any location on the file system that it is allowed to create in ODB and any type of DB file. That's very important. So whether you use a raw device or simply file systems or different mount points throughout your file system you want to ensure that the user MySQL has rights that location. We've committed to the following mount points. Let's just confirm them. Data 2, 3, 4, and 5. So let's navigate since we're logged in as root to the root of the file system and we'll just simply change the ownership for data 2, 3, 4, and 5 to the MySQL user. So let's chown MySQL and there's a group called MySQL data 2, 3, 4, and 5 and we can specify this using brace expansion so that's 2, 3, 4, and 5 followed by lsltr or let's do lsld data star now notice that with the exception of data 1 all data directories are owned by the user mysql and the group mysql so now we should be fine let's just confirm that we're not using data 1 and we're not we're using forward slash data 2 to store data 1 forward slash data 3 to store data 2 and that's the IB data 2 forward slash data 4 and so forth let's proceed with stopping MySQL at the stage of the game we'll RC MySQL stop and these files are pretty big so it'll take a while to create all of them and chances are likely since we're creating four data files that we are likely to d throw errors as a result of perhaps misconfiguration let's navigate into varlib mysql and we will extinguish the ib data files let's lsltr ib star and we'll remove rf ib star to reclaim some of the storage since we have no important data stored in any of these files and then once they're gone we'll go ahead and execute an rc mysql start and then begin the debug process if necessary generally when defining multiple files this will be the case you will need to debug the way we're defining files here for storing data throughout the file system is no different than you'd do with an enterprise DBMS such as DB2 or Oracle. It's a painstaking process planning databases and performing this work up front. It really is, but the 
optimizations and the time spent optimizing your DBMS will be well worth it when you have a user community happy with the query and response of your DBMS system. Now we got an error. Let's echo question mark. It came back zero. So this this is a cosmetic or not a real error. And since the return value was zero, let's net that NTL grep 3306 to confirm whether or not MySQL is running, and it isn't. So now we need to begin the debug process. Well, PSAX grep MySQL, and it actually says that it is running. We can certainly take a look at the error file. It's lsltr star dot err and we'll tail it to see what it didn't like. Let's send the last 50 lines to the screen and then pipe it to less. And we should be able to see if there are any problems. Couldn't find a table. HR test. This is the original table in ODB1 that we created that we blasted without dropping the table. Beyond that, let's see what else is uh, an issue to MySQL. And From what we can tell, this looks pretty clean. So we may have only returned an error because the internal data dictionary maintained by InnoDB shows that there's a table called test underscore InnoDB1 that MySQL could not find in any of the, any of the InnoDB files, which is fine. That's a separate error altogether, and we certainly could get rid of that. So MySQL is actually up and running. Let's take a look at the locations where we created data files. We'll navigate to the root and we'll lsld data star and here are the data directories. We should focus on all of them except data1. Let's lsltr h data2. In fact we could use brace expansion here. So we'll go at data2345 and we're looking for ib star. Let's see what comes back. Super. So everything was created nicely with the exception of, I don't see the 25 gigabyte file. Let's see if we did specify it. We said 25G. Maybe it didn't create it in data 5, and we'll find out why momentarily. But nonetheless, MySQL successfully created in data 2, IB data 1 for 5 gigs. Let's just confirm it. So first one should be 5, followed by 3, then 6. And here they are. 5, 3, and in data 4, let's see what it did here. Data 4, it created a 3 gig file. And if we DFH, 3.9 gig file, that is. Let's see what the status is of data 4. Data 4 was down to 981 megs. So we're actually out of space. And as a result, it didn't move on to data 5. So let's set data 4 instead to be 3 gigabytes and then remain with the original option for data 5. We'll modify it in the my.cnf file and try this process again. Let's go ahead and find it and we just need to alter 6. So let's find 6G and we'll change it to 3G. This should permit us to recreate these files. And from the shell, we can go ahead and create them, remove them all using the same ls command, but instead we'll just remove ib star from those directories. And then if we re execute lsltr with the brace expansion, those files would have been wiped. It just takes a while to remove them because they're pretty big, and it also takes a while for MySQL to come up creating such large files, which means the 25 gig file will take. A long time to be created as well. Let's rerun the LSL and those files are gone. Super. So now that they're gone, let's go ahead and RC MySQL stop. So again, the RC MySQL start stop script is failing because the InnoDB1 table no longer exists. And notice the RC script doesn't know how to handle this situation. So we'll kill the processes manually. Sometimes you just have to do this. We'll kill 11,081 as well as 11,104. And then PSAX grep MySQL again. And 81. 
and let's check it again and let's return to RC MySQL restart and let's see what happens it's attempting, attempting to start the server once again we'll quit the client that we currently have open and we can confirm whether or not the data files are the files are actually being written let's navigate to, to the root and we'll lsltr data star or data brace expansion 2345 followed by ib star to see what comes up and what you can see here is that the IB data one file is currently being created. Let's use a dash H to see how far along it is in human readable form, and it's up to two gigabytes. So the start process is actually creating the files. MySQL is starting, and it's following the etc my.cnf directive, and doing exactly what we expect it to do. So the process again can be arduous, and we certainly have not shown you everything you can do with InnoDB based tables for example you can create tables on raw partitions similar to the way Oracle permits you to and let's see what's changed in this and the files actually still growing although the start script has given up MySQL is running in the background by way of the safe script and is safely writing the files for us so later on we will see that all files would have been created our storage will be virtually down to nothing and we'll have access to all of the data files. Now we don't have data to populate all of these files, but nonetheless they're available and it proves that MySQL is following the directives as laid out. We're going to focus on a few other neat things that you can do with the InnoDB storage engine, including storing tables in individual files similar to MyISAM style tables, as well as storing your table data in raw devices or using raw disk space or physical disk space rather than fully partitioned disk space with a proper file system which improves performance with respect to database access since there's less overhead that's typically realized when the operating system performs non-buffered or performs buffered I.O. that is so we're going to look at two neat things one is the ability to spread our tables into or across individual table files table data files and the other is to use raw devices now let's see what the current state of MySQL is will PSAX grab MySQL and as you can see it's not running which means we'll go ahead and execute an RC MySQL start and troubleshoot any startup issues the startup seems to have gone cleanly so let's PSA exit again and as you can see it's running where we last left off we created some pretty large files in distinct partitions using the InnoDB data file path directive in the etc my.cnf file so we should have data files on data 2, data 3 data 4 as well as data 5 partitions. Let's take a brief look by navigating to the root of the file system and we'll lsl data star and this will list each of the data directories. Here's data 4's file and if we scroll up, in fact let's just lsl data star using our brace expansion for 2, 3, 4 and 5 forward slash IB data star or IB star and let's try it again we didn't close the brace and as you can see here are four data files that are created data is one two three and four in data two three four and five mount points respectively so our system's up and running but these particular files are stored within a typical file system space whereas when we look at raw devices you'll see how we can get rid of the file system and have InnoDB work directly with the raw devices similar to other enterprise class systems as mentioned InnoDB stores all tables and index information within one file or in n number of files depending on the number of files that you've specified in the InnoDB data file path the default is to create one InnoDB file 
let's go ahead and check our current setup and we'll resort to the default file and begin our studies of spreading tables out across multiple files. We'll execute MySQL followed by P for prompt and then we'll connect and execute a show databases and we've been working primarily with the HR database and once we get rid of the superfluous TNA you'll see that HR and HR2 exists and if we use HR followed by show tables we'll see all of our tables and as you can see there's an error even interacting with the HR database so let's go ahead and use HR2 and execute that show tables again and there are the tables here's the table 10 mil let's show create table 10 underscore mil and this particular table is in my ISAM type table which means we really have nothing defined in NLDB we're returning an error for the HR database because we removed the table data file IB data 1 without actually flushing from the system tables the table that was stored there so as a result MySQL is throwing an error but it's not a big deal this means that we can feel free to undefine the NODB data file path directive which specifies all these files and then remove those files so we can default to the default IB data 1 file let's go ahead and modify the etc my.cnf but before we do we just want to label this section multiple table files so step one is to resort and this isn't a requirement but this is what we're going to do to clean up the configuration we'll resort to the default IB data 1 in a DB file and then step two will be to spread all tables across multiple files the reason why we're going this route is that we want to set up a database in a few tables at least two tables within the default IB data file and then implement multiple table files to watch MySQL spread the tables across multiple files or multiple InnoDB compliant files so let's go ahead we'll quit the existing interface we'll execute an RC MySQL stop and then we'll pico when this is complete etc my.cnf and we'll simply comment out the InnoDB data home directory as well as InnoDB data file path and we'll be sure to keep everything on one line so that it isn't misread by the MySQL D interpreter so as you can see we need to comment out both variables because by default MySQL when it doesn't find an InnoDB data home directory directive will create an IB data one file in varlib MySQL which is the default directory we could simply go ahead and uncomment the previous InnoDB data home directory directive and this will work just fine but it's an implied default so we don't even need to specify it having said that let's save changes and we're free to remove all IB data one files or IB data files by simply executing an, a remove RF data braces two three four five followed by IB data star this will remove all of the IB data files on the system and return the utilized storage to the operating system it'll take a while because the files are pretty big but we'll confirm momentarily that we've actually cleaned up the files and then proceed to starting MySQL with the default InnoDB data file and then we'll create a database let's go ahead and execute a df-h and you'll see that what's available for most of our partitions that we use including datas 2, 3, 4 and 5 are pretty much all of the originally free spaces so we've removed the files let's go ahead and execute an lsltr data braces 2, 3, 4, 5 IB star and you'll see that it's all clean which means we've reclaimed our storage and we're free to restart MySQL so we'll simply execute RC MySQL start and then we'll navigate once this is complete into varlib MySQL we'll wait for it to come up this will create the default file let's go into varlib MySQL and we'll lsltr h ib star where you'll find the default 10 megabyte data file which also stores index information as well as the two 
log files. The log files are 96 megabytes because there are directives in the etc my.cnf file controlling the size of the log files. But that's okay because we're going to specify large data files soon enough. So now that we have these defaults, let's use MySQL to create a new database. So we're up to step two, which is, or in fact, let's relabel this as three. So step two is really to define a new database with two new tables. And then step three is to spread that information across multiple files. Let's show databases. As you can see, we have HR, HR2. We no longer need HR2. Let's attempt to drop it as a result. So we'll drop database HR2. And it returns an error because it doesn't even find the directory. Let's try it for HR. It too returns an error because it's no longer referenced. So these are two corrupt databases. Let's rerun show databases and we'll define yet a new database. We'll create database HR3, or let's call it HR3 well, three should work fine. And we'll follow that up with two create table statements. We'll recreate our employees table as well as the pay scale table. So let's create table employees and we should use the syntax if not exists and its name of course will be employees and we'll define some fields including ID let's set it to be int as well as auto increment followed by primary key set to the ID column followed by F name set to var car 20 followed by L name set to varcar 20 and we've gotten that out of the way we don't need the other information but we do want to set a field for the pay scale ID so let's define pay underscore scale underscore ID to be of type int and it'll reference the auto incremented field in the yet to be defined table let's end this description and close this out. Now, of course, we want this table to be stored using InnoDB. So we'll have to specify the engine type by setting engine equivalent to InnoDB. And of course, we haven't selected the database, so we'll use HR3 and then rerun that command. Let's find our history and now we have a new table created always confirm the engine type that your table is using to be sure that it's being stored in the correct location so we'll execute a show create and this is for our table employees and as you can see the engine type is NODB which means the data when loaded or if loaded will be loaded into the default IB data one file but we're not concerned with loading any data at this stage we are concerned with splitting the table so let's go ahead and define a new table so we'll execute a create table if not exists and on a separate line we'll label this table as pay underscore scale and its definition will include an ID column which will be auto incremented and its type is int and it will be the primary key and we need one other column which stores the salary which we'll just simply call salaries and set it to be a decimal field that will be able to hold 11 comma 2 or 11 values this should suffice and of course we want this table to be stored using InnoDB if you don't store it or define it using InnoDB you know the default as per the show engines in output will cause a table to be stored using my ISAM. So keep that in mind. So in between the last parentheses we should specify that the engine and last parentheses and the semicolon which terminates the, st the statement we should specify that the engine is equivalent to InnoDB. Let's go ahead and execute a show tables and then we'll execute a show create table for pay underscore scale since we're redefining our HR structure so now you can see that both tables are stored using the InnoDB engine which means as we load data let's SUN just to confirm again as we load data 
that data for the time being will be loaded into the IB data 1 file by way of the IB log file 0 and IB log file 1 transactional log files notice that the files are still their default sizes let's turn on the human readable option because we've yet to load any data we've simply defined the database and its two tables but that's all that's necessary to implement the multiple tables so step three is now to spread all tables across multiple files now you may be wondering what is the purpose for spreading across multiple files the purposes can be many fold but in our case let's suppose that the employees table is far likely to store much more information than let's say pay scale or in cases where you have some tables that you'd like to manage independently of the remainder of the database it becomes ideal to be able to manage the information in a separate data file so that you can treat it separately which means you can back it up and restore it independent of the other related tables within your InnoDB structure. So rather than lumping all information into one IB data one file, if you spread the key tables that are used frequently and are large and may need to be backed up and restored independently in a separate file, you may gain some efficiencies and a more manageable environment as a result. So to set this directive or to set up our service so that it performs the multiple table files in ETC my.cnf beneath the my sqld section we will need to specify a new directive and it's called inno db underscore file underscore per underscore table simply setting this directive will enable the multiple files or one file per table each file will contain the table data including any number of indices up to the limit that are defined for the table. Keep that in mind. So let's go ahead and copy this directive into the etc my.cnf file. We'll just simply copy it and from the shell use pico in one of our windows to modify etc my.cnf and beneath mysqld preferably in the InnoDB section will define the directive. So let's do it in an easy to define area and we'll comment it. Use to define one InnoDB file per table and this is the directive that's necessary we won't lose any data as a result of defining this directive and you'll see that we'll be able to switch in and out of multiple table files rather seamlessly without losing any information whatsoever let's go ahead and save it and then execute an RC MySQL we'll stop and then start. It'll take a little bit to come down. Let's execute the start. And then we'll take a brief look at our default directory by executing an LSLTR IB star. And you'll notice that the default file is still there. This is the IB log file, IB log file 1, and IB data 1. These are the default files. However, let's take a look at what's changed. We'll navigate into HR3, which is our new database. And you'll notice that the employees.form and pay underscore scale.form files exist, as well as the db.opt file, but no per table data files. And that's because after making the change, after having created the tables already, the change does not impact existing tables. So you'll need to create a new table in order to realize the change. So let's return to MySQL. We'll execute a show tables. As you can see, employees and pay scale exists, and their corresponding FRM files also exist, but no independent data files. This means that tables that are created prior to implementing the InnoDB file per table directive will continue to be stored in the default IB data one file and will be auto extended appropriately. However, new tables that are created will be redirected to independent files so we should go ahead and create a new file or a new table which will in effect create a new file let's execute a create table if not exists client and we'll define it to be of course auto ID which is our favorite so ID auto increment 
It will set it to be the primary key as usual, followed by client name, which will be varcar50. And we'll set the engine, of course, to be inno db. Let's go ahead and take a brief look at the tables by executing show tables once more and you'll see that the new clients table has been created although there is no data in it and from the file system let's rerun that LSLTR and notice clients.frm has been created which describes the table as well as clients.ibd which is the InnoDB based file which corresponds to that table alone. So a quick note which we've just mentioned but we'll mention again note per table files apply only after the inno db file per table directive has been applied so it won't apply to existing tables which means that i ideally try to forecast and plan as much as possible up front to avoid having to make serious alterations after certainly we could re-architect things we could dump the existing two tables and re-import them into new tables that certainly would work so for example really all that exists is the structure for each of these tables so a show create table clients for example would show us the syntax that's necessary to recreate the table similarly if we were to execute from the shell mysql dump and we'll do so Let's navigate up a level and execute MySQL dump and we'll specify that it dumps the structure only, no data, although there is no data, followed by PETA prompt for password, followed by the name of the database, which is HR3. This will dump the structure for each of the databases or each of the tables as defined within the HR3 database. Let's specify the password and there's the structure. So we simply copy the structure or the text that you see here and execute it after having dropped the tables. So let's go ahead and do it. And notice that both of the statements are prefixed with drops because MySQL dump prepares the output so that it's ideal for re-importing. So all we need to do is just copy this or redirect it to a text file and we'll be fine. Recreating the database, of course, and everything will be set up in InnoDB. So this would work if we re-imported it into MySQL without doing a thing. And perhaps that's something we should do. So let's go ahead and rerun this command, dumping it to an output file. We'll call it hr3 recreate.sql. This will create the tables. I didn't see a statement for creating the database because we're indicating the table that we'd like to dump, or the database that we'd like to dump and we'll specify the password and again let's look at hr3 underscore recreate dot sql and as you can see it focuses on the tables not the database so what we'll do from within mysql is to drop the database hr3 let's drop database hr3 the mysql dump would have taken care of backing up the structure for us since it contains no data and then we'll execute a show databases. Notice that our context is shifted from HR3 to none. The database no longer exists. So let's go ahead and create it. It's only a container. So we'll create database HR3. And then from the shell, we'll execute a MySQL command to import the contents of HR3 underscore recreate. We don't need to use MySQL dump, dump, dumps from the database to a text file or to stand it out. So let's execute MySQL prompt for password and we want to operate or we want these SQL statements to be affected on the HR3 database so we'll specify HR3. We could go ahead and just specify the, the password on the command line so it doesn't prompt us. And then we'll import HR3 and that's the wrong import. We want to import, let's rerun this, MySQL abc123 against hr3 and we want to import the hr3 underscore recreate file if we echo the exit status you'll see that it's clean and if we return to the connection that will be that is still open and if we lost it would have would will recreate itself and execute a show databases 
you'll see that HR3 exists. So let's use it, followed by a show tables, and you'll see that the tables have been recreated. Now let's execute a show create table for each of the tables, including clients, InnoDB, employees, we just want to confirm the type for each of the databases. That's fine. And we will assume, but we can double check if you don't like assuming, that pay scale is properly set. And it is. We should now confirm from the file system's perspective that the files have indeed been created beneath the HR3 subdirectory. So let's navigate into it and notice that each table has its own file. Pay scale, IBD, employees, clients, and so forth. Now we did mention that if you were to revert to using a single shared file for all the tables, tables and indices, that MySQL via the InnoDB storage engine will take care of things for you gracefully. So for example, let's return to the shell and describe employees. Employees requires ID, first name, last name, and pay scale ID. They can all be null, so let's go ahead and insert a value into it. So we'll insert into employees and we'll set the columns that we want to insert into, including F name equivalent to the following followed by L name equivalent to the following followed by pay scale ID equivalent to the following we've inserted and now if we execute a select from this table we should see the results so let's select star from employees just to be sure that the data is there and it is now let's go ahead and remove from my.cnf the directive that we recently placed in the file to cause MySQL to split the InnoDB files. Or we'll comment it out, which effectively removes it from the configuration upon the next restart of MySQL. So let's go ahead and peek OETC my.cnf. And we'll disable or comment the per table option. And then execute an RC MySQL restart and MySQL will restart itself but rely now upon the default IBData1 InnoDB file to serve the data. Let's LSLTR. You'll see that the file still exists but also one level up if we execute IB star, LSLTR IB star, those files exist as well and they have a more recent in fact timestamp of 1729 which means they're ready to go to IBData1 and the default log file. So when we return to the interface, which is here, and execute a select star from employees, there's the data. We have to reconnect, of course, but the client takes care of that for us automatically. So the data is now being served from the main file. And we certainly could go ahead and blow away these IBD files, and it wouldn't be a problem, because it's now being shared from, sent, sent to us or delivered to us from the shared file. So that's a little bit about configuring multiple table files. You certainly can do so using the InnoDB file per table directive, but it applies only to tables that are created after enabling the directive. So create the setup prior to defining your tables, or simply dump your tables after you've effected the change and re-import them, and you'll have per file table or per table files to represent your table data. Now we did mention like other enterprise class DBMSs that MySQL supports using raw devices for storing data files, InnoDB data files, to increase or to realize increased performance. Let's label this section appropriately. We'll call it storing InnoDB data files on raw partitions. This is an interesting feature, and it's been supported by enterprise DBs such as Oracle and IBM DB, IBM's DB2 for years. The idea is as follows. When you typically allocate a file system to a raw partition, the operating system incurs some sort of performance hit to manage the file system. And that performance hit translates into slower read and write times for your database engine. So if for some reason you find that your tables or some of your databases are underperforming and you're interested in increasing performance without having to necessarily change your hardware, you may want to consider 
using raw partitions and raw partitions are very likely to result in faster access time to your data. Now how do we set up raw partitions? First and foremost raw partitions are generally on a Linux based system located beneath dev and it's usually something such as the following dev followed by the keyword to access a given hard drive such as SDB3. So SDB for a SCSI drive and 3 for the partition. The easiest way to tell what partitions are available on your system is to simply execute a DF followed by the human readable option to make it easy to parse. And we've done it and we'll do it again. Here's a DF-H output and as you can see we have many partitions. The root partition is 24 gigabytes and it houses the operating system and it has 20 gigabytes available. So this is not a candidate for raw partition usage by the database engine because it would require for us to remove the forward slash file system which would effectively erase our entire setup. TempFS is in memory and is also not a candidate. However, notice that there are other partitions purposely created datas 1 through 5 and they are candidates. They can be used. They are not required. You just simply want to confirm that your key partitions such as log for example as well as boot are not in the way of any of the key partitions that are required to start your system. But in our case that is we don't have that problem because we would see for example forward slash boot for a given partition. In this case we've just set up independent partitions data or independent mount point on mount points on independent partitions so we really don't have a problem. All of our system related mount points such as if we navigate to the root such as boot for example where the kernel is located is mounted on the primary file system or the root file system that includes again boot, lib, etc as well as home as well as proc which is in memory but does mount to the file system initially sys, user, temp, var, serve, sbin and so forth as well as opt. All of these different directories are mounted on this particular file system. tempfs is in memory so we'll ignore it and we are free to use datas 1 through 5 or sda2, sdc2, sda3, sda1, sdb1. To illustrate how this is can be implemented, we will just select one partition to wipe, or when we say wipe, to render as a raw partition. Because all of these partitions that are candidates are currently formatted using a particular file system. In all, in all likelihood, the riser file system, since we're using the SUSE distro. And as a result, because file systems are already created on these partitions, these partitions are not candidates for usage as raw partitions. So a few things we need to keep in mind. We need to select the dev devices. These are the raw partitions on the left where file systems mount various mount points. We need to select the dev partitions that we'd like to work with and then we'll, we need to ensure that they are indeed raw partitions. So let's say we want to go ahead and use dev sdb1 if we copy this into memory and we'll lsltr data 4 because that's where it is mounted or is accessible to the user space you'll see that it contains a lot of stuff but it isn't important to our system so let's go ahead and place right here that we want to use in fact we copied the wrong item we'll copy it again we want to go ahead and use slash dev slash sdb1 as our raw partition our first raw partition and by the way you can use multiple raw partitions to store your data across multiple disks. So our candidate is S dev is located at dev sdb1. So first note the user mysql must have write permissions to the raw device. That's important. So similar to us granting mysql partition permissions for the various mount points, datas 1 through 5, we will need to, when we have rendered data 4 into, or SDB1 back to a raw partition, we'll need to grant the MySQL user enough permissions to be able to read and write the database from the raw partition. So that's important. That's a step one. We need to have that in place. And note also, slash dev SDB1 must be a raw partition which means 
it must not contain a file system such as ext3 or 2 slash 3 riser fs etc so again we know that a file system is configured because there's a mount point which is directed to the raw partition that's of interest to us or that is a candidate for us for usage we need to go ahead and use the proper tools to remove this partition there are many ways we can remove the partition a simple way to work with the partition within a Linux space is to use either the parted utility or the fdisk utility the fdisk utility followed by the L option will list all of the partitions and disks that are on the system here are the disks SDA is one, SDB is another, and SDC is yet another one. We're interested in the third part or the first partition that is on SDB. So when we use FDisk, we will specify the disk as follows forward slash dev, forward slash SDB, and the partition number is one. This is the disk that we'd like to operate on. If we execute P for print, it'll print partitions that are defined. Notice that it says SDB1 is a 10.4 gigabyte partition, and we can confirm it from our DF output by simply scrolling up past the FDisk output, and we should see that SDB1 is roughly 10 gigabytes. This is the partition that we want to wipe. If you execute a help, you'll see that by simply executing D and the partition number, we can delete the partition. Now it says no partitions are actually defined yet. Let's print that and show you that the partition isn't actually defined because we specified SDB1. So by quitting the interface and going to SDB, which is one level up, and then executing a print or a P, you'll see that we now see the partitions. So what we're trying to point out is the fact that by simply running the DF command, you can take the information and pass it into FDisk, but you want to pass in only up to the unique portion, which makes which means the drive and not a, a specific partition on the drive. So you want to indicate the drive, but not the actual partition number. So it's FDisk followed by forward slash dev forward slash SDB. And then once you're in, you can execute a P to print, and you'll see the partitions that are available. We're now free to remove partitions from this particular disk and the partition that we want to work with is SDB1. Additionally, if the disk contains additional space, we could create an additional raw partition without deleting any existing partitions. That's something else to keep in mind. However, in our case, pretty much the entire disk is in use. You can tell because, for example, the output of print within FDisk tells us that there are 4427 cylinders yet our final partition SDB3 occupies from 1405 to 4427 so you can tell and that also because there's a partition right before 1405 which spans from 1276 to 1404 and there's a partition from 1 to 1275 so that all blocks all cylinders and all blocks are contiguously in use so there really is no free space on this particular disk which is why we need to delete the partition so we'll go ahead and D and press 1 to delete partition number 1 and then rerun P to print. To commit these changes to the file system, you'll need to write to update the file system table. Sometimes this doesn't take place immediately. Sometimes it's required that you execute a reboot. And in those cases, you may want to consider using a tool such as Parted, which forces the changes to take place immediately. Let's rerun FDisk, rerun print, and you'll see that it thinks that the partition's gone but if we attempt to recreate the partition it may or may not work if it fails we'll need to reboot the system or use a utility such as parted I'll simply just go ahead and execute the help command and you'll see that if you want to go ahead and set up a new partition you'll just run the n command this will specify n for new partition and you need to specify whether it's primary or extended we'll set it's it's a primary partition number one and it'll span from cylinder one through the cylinder that's not in use twelve seventy five twelve seventy six is in use all the way through forty four twenty seven so let's use up to twelve seventy five which is the default by the way as specified in the output now let's reprint the partition table and you'll see that there's a new partition sdb one but it may or may not be usable again We'll write the changes to the file system. 
and then we'll quit fdisk once this is complete and now we're out and it says usually this will be reusable when the system restarts but ideally there is now a raw partition located in dev sdb1 that we can provide access to mysql but notice that this raw partition is owned by root and is accessible by disk with read, read permissions on the partition this is the device which shows up with this odd looking color scheme that will need to grant access to mysql so we'll want to change mod or change ownership on this that is so we would want to chown mysql forward slash dev forward slash sdb1 so that the mysql user owns a device now mysql owns it and is able to interact with it freely and the user can read write it and do anything to it from a raw perspective so let's move on with the configuration if the system needs to be rebooted in order for this to work no big deal but it won't prevent us from actually configuring mysql and then after rebooting the system when mysql starts it'll find that it'll have the right to create the InnoDB related files on the raw partition so what's required to create the raw partition access well the directives are quite similar to defining multiple files or using the InnoDB data file path directive it's actually the same directive that we've specified let's find in our history here it is and we'll just copy a recent example of it up to the first file that was defined and then we'll navigate towards the bottom and specify that this is a syntax but there's some slight differences that need to be specified instead of using a typical file system mount point we're going to go ahead and specify the raw partition location which is dev sdb1 that's important and also we'll need to specify the size so let's go ahead and specify the size as being perhaps five gigabytes and there's a keyword that must be specified immediately following the size of the partition and that is the keyword new raw now we're gonna go ahead and copy this line and paste it once and change the second version of it to raw the reason is as follows the first step when configuring InnoDB for a raw partition is that you define the InnoDB data file path to a raw partition and by the way you can add as many raw partition files as you'd like so the first step is to specify it followed by new raw then you start in the MySQL database engine which causes InnoDB to initialize so we should say this initializes the raw files and then we stop MySQL and rerun it with simply raw and this allows usage of the raw files so it's a two-step process hopefully in the future this will become a one-step process and InnoDB will perhaps store some sort of internal flag which indicates whether or not the raw partition has been initialized but for the first time that MySQL utilizes the raw partition it needs to know that this is the very first time you're setting up the table data files in this particular raw partition so you do that the first time and then you stop the server restart it but before you restart it you specify simply raw and in between these two steps you don't want to create any tables and you don't want to insert any data to be stored in the raw file space because any changes that you make in between steps one and two will be lost your changes should come after so we'll list th step three as create table and load data so you want to commit step one first which causes MySQL to initialize the data file step two which recognizes it and provides it for usage to the user community and then step three is to begin defining your tables and using the load data features such as MySQL import as well as the MySQL utility let's go ahead and specify this directive in our etc my.cnf file and again if there's a problem accessing the file MySQL will tell us and we'll be able to find the error in the hostname.err file so it's not a big deal to track down problems and usually rebooting will fix the problem let's go ahead and specify this here this will be our new raw file and then we'll go ahead and execute an RC MySQL stop to ensure that it's not running 
we don't want it to use any of the existing data files and then we'll execute an RC MySQL start and again any errors that are encountered are generally related to the system not providing access to the raw device immediately but we'll troubleshoot momentarily so far it looks good because it's taking a long time to initialize which could mean that it's creating the 5 gigabyte file for usage otherwise MySQL would have come up with an error by now so we'll wait this out and then simply consult the last section of the error file to be sure that nothing's gone awry and in fact in a separate window you can execute a watch tail against linuxcbtdb1.err or the error file and this will echo anything that it sees to be a problem notice it says file operation call open cannot continue operation it notices the file as dev sdb1 and there could be a problem we'll find out momentarily that's psax grep mysql and it's not actually running so it's thrown an error it's going to try to start again and again if it throws an error it's because it's having problems working with the raw device which can be rectified by simply rebooting the system this is the last information that was written to the file so we have no updates as as of yet because mysql via InnoDB is attempting to interact with the raw partition so we'll wait it out and if it fails again we'll simply restart the server altogether causing it to be able to write the five gigabyte file also beware of using this particular feature to define large files because when you reboot if MySQL is to start by default it could slow the startup of your server and let's take a brief look here to see what's in the file and it still says cannot continue the operation will PSAX grep again to see whether or not it's running and it isn't that's netstat NTL and we'll see that 3306 is not listening so what we're gonna do at this stage is reboot the box and as we move on to our next section we'll will confirm that the raw file has been created but basically that's all there is to creating the raw file you will need to have the raw partition accessible and it needs to be accessible to the user MySQL once that's taken care of then you simply specify the InnoDB data file path followed by the actual path to the raw partition followed by the size for new followed by the size and new raw that is and then once it initializes you start it up with raw and then data files will be written to the raw partition so next we're going to continue our studies of MySQL with PHP integration and we'll consult on our raw file creation.